Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, this is a Q&A session that we kind of threw together last minute, more of an AMA. Uh, there's been a lot of announcements and things in the industry in the last year. I found myself at the front seat of some of it. Um, there's just a lot going on right now. If you don't know me, my name is Mike McGrath. I'm currently the Vice President of Core Platforms Engineering at Red Hat, and that includes all of our operating systems, so RHEL, Fedora, CentOS. It includes things like uh, OpenStack, Insights, uh, satellite, and a lot of those related technologies. Uh, but I got my start in the Fedora community. Um, I was a volunteer before I started working at Red Hat 17-ish years ago. Uh, I spent a long time uh, working in that role. Uh, eventually, I left Fedora and was a founding member of OpenShift. Uh, and so for all of V1 and V2, I was the infrastructure lead for that and the uh, OpenShift uh, architect. And then for V3, I noped on out of there for the Docker times. Uh, <clears throat> and then I uh, kind of just worked my way through uh, various roles uh, in the operating system team until uh, I got to the spot that I have now. So with that, uh, if anybody has any questions you'd like to ask me about uh, what's going on, raise a hand. Be got before, a before we get taken over with like questions, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand, please keep it raised and I can kind of get to you as, as like, we get through the questions, if that's okay. Absolutely. I'll, I'll give you an easy one, sure. because I'm sure the audience is not going to be too easy on you. <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, what are you most excited about right now, um, just generally in the Linux industry? Uh, I'm actually, I am, uh, I'll get on the hype train. I'm pretty excited about AI. I think there's going to be a lot of, uh, I think a lot of very interesting things are going to come out of that. And I'll, I'll just share my anecdote. I actually may have mentioned this to some of you already. Uh, this last, uh, during uh, uh, winter, uh, Red Hat has a company shutdown where all of us kind of go away for Christmas and stuff. And I, I kind of made a Christmas resolution to go and look at all the AI technologies that exist. And if you haven't actually tried to get a model up and running on your system, the barrier to entry was way, way lower than I thought it was going to be. And uh, I'd set some goals for myself uh, for the entire break, and I had met them within the first four days. And now, uh, it, with my team, we've been encouraging it. And uh, I know people have been using it to do a lot of things that they don't like to do. Um, I've dabbled in having it write my status reports with mixed success. <laughs> and uh, I know for a fact that there's at least a couple of people in my team that use it to, we have quarterly connections. That's our HR term for when you meet with your manager and say, hey, this is what I'm going to be doing for the year they're using AI to write their quarterly connections with actually really high quality, because you can write a big thing, it can be this long, and just taking their status reports, say, hey, this is actually a little bit too long, make it smaller. Saves them a lot of time. I think it's, uh, it's interesting. Very cool. Thank you. So we've got him. Hey, Mike. Um, what Hi. do you think is the most important thing Fedora should be doing right now? And if your number one answer is AI, what's your number two answer? I, I do have, a, I have an internal project name called Project Mullet that uh, has been slowly pushing through, which is AI related. For me, number two is uh, a recruitment and uh, volunteers. Uh, you've, I've been in several discussions and things over the, this, uh, uh, during this week. And I think there's a couple of things going on. Certainly 17 years ago, if you wanted to volunteer and get involved in open source, there were some open source projects that you could get involved with, but the center of gravity tended to be the Linux distributions, and that is not the case anymore. Um, I think getting the word out about volunteering, especially to uh, college-age people, uh, gives them experience that they need and brings much-needed uh, 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 ambition and youth and all the good things that come with that to our, our programs. I, Enjoyed speaking with all of you, but there's not a lot of, I would say, young people out there. I think it would be really good to, uh, to change that. Hey, Mike. Um, hey, I wanted to kind of get your take on what you feel about the sustainability of open source moving forward, specifically, you know, I mean, over the last, you know, 15, 20 years, things really shifted where it seems now any open source without some corporate funding somewhere um, is bound to, you know, 
is bound to hit the floor. So just wanted to get your take on that. I, <clears throat> I think the success of open source and its interest in business was a like that's a natural thing to happen. Um, I think there are a lot of people that kind of yearn for the days of uh, hobbyists and uh, you know working uh, more in that in that realm. I think open source is as uh, uh, relevant and will be as successful as it has ever been. I don't think that we're on any sort of downward trend. Um, I think it, you can actually just look at uh, the AI stuff that's coming out. Um, the current open source solutions, and we can get into license washing if you really want, but uh, Olama, a lot of the stuff that's coming out uh, is roughly where ChatGPT was, what, a year ago? Like, the, the, the race is on. And I, I think that uh, the sustainability of the whole thing is going to be just fine. I think that there are, I think there have been some adjustments needed. And uh, I also think this has come up a couple times too, which is in the early days, I'm going to say late 80s through 90s, so the early 2000s, there was a we're going to conquer the world mentality with, a, with, uh, with open source. And then we did it. And so now we've got to make that shift from conquering to, uh, to, to ruling. And if you've watched Game of Thrones or read any of the books, you know there's two different concepts. It's a, that's a very classic literature uh, conundrum. And I think that we're still making that shift right now. Uh, but I think it's going to be fine. Hey, Mike, I wanted to ask hey, what Adam. operating system are you running on your work laptop that you use every day? Uh, my daily driver is Fedora. On my laptop, uh, Red Hat actually recently uh, switched from using RHEL as their CSB to Fedora as their CSB. I typically run CentOS Stream on my laptop, but for the last uh, four months or so, I've been using the Fedora-based CSB just to see how well IT is doing it. They're doing fine. <laughs> so I used to think of Red Hat as a company that made money because even though all the software was free open source software, they were great at support, and that's where they made their money. And that seems to not be Red Hat's um, business plan anymore. How would you describe what Red Hat does to make money? I think that uh, Red Hat still does exactly what it used to do to make money, but I think people got, I think people are mischaracterizing support as I'm going to call and use a phone and get questions answered. To me, support is all the money we put into partnering relationships with OEMs, with ISVs, the countless number of trips I've had to take over the last year to go meet with NVIDIA to make sure that things are working OK, and NVIDIA is now doing some more open source stuff, which is super great to see. Um, I think that support includes documentation, active bug analysis, testing, all kinds of other stuff that people don't often look at when they think about support, but they're the things that we do. And so, yeah, for me, I think that there was, uh, for many, many years, this kind of concept of, well, you know, they just do support, and I'm smart enough, I don't need to call Red Hat for support, so I don't need anything else that they do. But the life cycle that we put around uh, RHEL, all that work is the support that we do, and it's a lot of work, and it is way more work than just what the support team does. And so the business model hasn't changed. It's the same as it ever was. Don't be shy now. We're here for another 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to turn back to AI for just a second. Please. So all the work that's being done around Instruct Labs, uh, where do you see that intersection for us in Fedora? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a good question. So if you don't know, Instruct Lab was part of a major announcement that we made at Red Hat Summit this year. It is, I guess, I don't know if you want to call it a partnership or whatever. We're working together with IBM uh, with their Granite model. And it is a way to democratize what models know and what models can do. So there's you know, obviously a lot of, I don't know what you want to call it, metadata. There's data around that that you can go and change and get involved with. Uh, and then there's a whole slew of software around that as well. Um, during that, at that moment, we also uh, announced something called RHEL AI, which is kind of a purpose-built operating system for that Granite and Struck Lab model. Uh, I think what we should be doing in the Fedora space is 
taking a look at some of those lower level bits that we always do. I'm a big fan of PyTorch. Um, at some point in time, somebody had mentioned to me, you know, at this point, PyTorch already has like 10,000 packages that integrate with it or depend on it. That, that to me is, you know, PyTorch and some of those related areas, that is uh, the kernel of AI for what open source is gonna be. And it's great, I, I know a lot of you are uh, Red Hatters. I'd imagine that uh, a lot of you know Python. So it's already pretty well built into our ability to contribute to it. Uh, for me, I would go looking there. And then the last part of that is uh, a bit on the recruitment side. I've been talking with Matthew and, and trying to get others to look at meeting developers where they are and maybe getting Fedora to start producing things that aren't just uh, a Linux base. So uh, developers, whether we like it or not, are often on Macs. I think that we could be building a PyTorch distribution that runs the same on Fedora, on Macs, and elsewhere. I think that that would be, you know, if I had my druthers, I think that is something worth investing in and looking at, it, just to really make Fedora relevant in the AI space, because it's kind of wide open right now. Hello, Mike. Uh, Mike. So I wanted to ask you, if you were a college goer today, and you were to start contributing to Fedora, what would you look at? Me, personally? Yeah. I'd go back and join the infrastructure team. Uh, it's just, I'm an ops guy, and I'd go do that. Um, if I uh, wanted to go and make a difference, um, I would look at some of the, uh, I would look at some of the things that would add polish to the organization. I brought this up at, uh, I forget what it was, uh, we, were, we had these round tables, uh, things like uh, search engine optimization. Our SEO is pretty crappy right now. Um, I often, you know, if I go to Google something, we'll get sent to Arch Linux or so, you know, something like that. And it, and it, it hurts my heart every time it happens. Um, I think, uh, and I also would uh, probably take a deeper look at the contribution model. It's both difficult to start contributing and the docs aren't there. I'm generally gonna avoid saying the docs are the solution to those things, but I do think it could be easier. Hi, Mike. Um, so a lot of, com a lot of uh, companies, not Red Hat specifically, but a lot of companies that are pushing AI uh, out there, I'll, I'm sure everybody here has seen some of the missteps with uh, recent ads uh, for AI stuff. But a, a lot of it uh, seems to be derived about, around the idea of removing humans from the uh, creative process. And uh, how do you answer people who are curious about whether or not developing and helping to develop AI is actively uh, engineering themselves out of uh, a position? That's, that's a, uh, a question I get a lot internally at Red Hat. As you can imagine, the emails that we get at Red Hat are very uh, AI, pro-AI. Our CEO is really big on it right now um, <laughs> for good reason. Uh, I would say, uh, as someone who, who I, you know, I feel like I've embraced AI, I'm, I'm a fan of it. I've been trying to use it where I can. Uh, I don't think that there's any real danger. If, if, if you're somebody that is worried about being replaced or losing your job, I don't think there's a danger that AI is gonna replace you in your job, but I do think there's a danger that someone that knows how to utilize AI properly is gonna replace you in, in your job. And I think when you look at AI as a tool to make you more efficient, um, uh, I think that it opens up a lot of really interesting possibilities. I'll give you an example. Uh, we have quarterly business reviews uh, at Red Hat and uh, we record them. And so I've got a, you know, I've got a recording and the transcripts for uh, our various QBRs over the years, and I can push those with RAG into a model, and suddenly I can have actual chatbot conversations with a meeting. These are you know half day to day long meetings where a lot goes on, and I can ask them things like, hey, I remember somebody was concerned about X, who was that? And it will tell me who it was. That makes me incredibly uh, uh, more efficient at my job, because it's something like that could take me an hour to go, hey, I have to go out to, our general manager, Gunner, and say, hey, who said this or that? I can just go and say, I remember somebody's concerned specifically about this one thing, who was it? Or I remember uh, you know, this PM had uh, a few concerns, what were they? And it can summarize them for me. And that's been interesting to work through. It's nice. Um, so uh, Fedora did a survey recently trying to gauge what sentiment within the community, both from a contributor perspective and user perspective, and Long story short, we're divided. <laughs> so yes. I, I don't think that's, that's new necessarily. I would expect so. nothing less. <laughs> um, so from your perspective with being someone who's very interested in AI and, and, and seeing that, um, 
what would be the dream AI implementation in Fedora? Like if Fedora was like, hey, let's 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 go, you know, locked arms with Red Hat for your vision. What would we be working on? Yeah, I think uh, the the boundary for Fedora would probably stop at models. I don't think that we were going to get into the model training business. I think uh, that doesn't play to our strengths. But I think supporting those models and I think uh, providing ethically sourced software and uh, uh, doing it in a way that is easy to do, easy to use. Uh, you got to remember a lot of the research that's going on right now is being done by data scientists, and they have probably taken computer engineering classes. They probably know how to code. I would suspect fewer of them generally know how to make code for something that is in a product that has a life cycle. At least that's been my experience working with researchers. And I think for us, that's something we can do to support them. We can, get, we can have a multiplier effect for those researchers. Um, but I do think that our boundary is going to stay at that software layer and trying to find um, ways to integrate with those models, whether they run locally or remotely. And so that's why I think it's not a big stretch for us. Uh, I think it plays to our strengths. But uh, I also think bringing the, uh, the community as we have it kind of up to some base level where they know what AI is and what it can do is helpful. I suspect there are probably some good use cases, too, that we could have in uh, the community. I know uh, a log detective is one that we've been looking at, for example, as a way to more quickly uh, troubleshoot build failures. It's a pretty easy thing to do, or maybe not easy, but a pretty useful thing to do. And I think that we'll see some, some areas like that that are good, too. I'd love to see more. Where, where did Adam go? I'd love to see more uh, QE-related things, too. Uh, I think there's some good test uh, testing works that we can do. That'd be good. You observed uh, a moment ago that uh, distributions were once uh, the uh, center of gravity for the free and open source software community, and really are no longer. Uh, what's your think? What's your what do you th what do you think the reason for that is, and and where do you think that leaves things like reproducible builds? Um, supply chain security and other things where it seems like, I, at least I think, distributions could really help. Um, I think, what I think that means is that we won. Um, what I think that's going to entail long term, the secure supply chain is actually an excellent example. Um, that is one where we are still very relevant, where trust is important. Um, I think that that's uh, you know, something that Red Hat is currently investing a lot of money into uh, to try to make sure that that flow of code um, is uh, once it comes from an upstream that it is what we intended to pull. Um, I know there's been a lot said about Red Hat's source code uh, plans, but we still have an upstream first policy, and so we continue to pull those things up into upstream before we pull them back down in almost every case. Um, it's pretty rare when that doesn't happen. And uh, yeah, I think that that's uh, uh, one area where distributions are still very important. But I'll just be honest, that's not sexy work. That's not, uh, I don't think there's going to be too many people coming out of colleges going, you know what, guys? I'm going to major in secure supply chains. I just don't, I don't see that happening. And, uh, and that's a pro that represents a real problem. But it also you know, perfectly makes sense when you look at where distributions are on their maturity. You know, this, is, this is the kind of problems that we're solving now. And uh, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a lot of hard work, and it's going to be hard work that's done by all of us. Uh, but like I said, that's, uh, it's hard to put a recruiting, uh, a recruiting campaign together for that you know, if you're going to try to get uh, new and interesting contributors, I think. I'd love to be proven wrong on that if somebody has an idea. We, we've touched a bit on things that could be added or expanded in the Fedora mission. Uh, if you could stop something, what would you stop? Uh, oh, tons of our infrastructure. Uh, anything that I wrote should have been long gone by now, uh, except for Zodbot. Uh, he can live on. But yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think we could greatly simplify the way that we're doing things. I would love to see us adopt more externally created items. Um, I don't know if that's a Jenkins or something else. Um, but I do think, <laughs> what? What is it? OpenQA. OK, OpenQA, that's fine. But I do think uh, I've made this joke, and there, there's, a, there's some amount of this. Uh, but I'm sure many of you have heard the, uh, the concept of, of not invented here syndrome. 
I think that we need to get a case of the opposite of that, where it's time for us to go out and formally adopt uh, some of these these uh, technologies from others, whether that's Debian or any, you know, I think we, there's a lot of communities out there that are utilizing things. Um, and it, you know, Debian is not different from Fedora because of the infrastructure that they've selected. And I think that in all the various communities that we have, there's uh, some work that we could do together that would benefit everybody. An increasing number of our users interact with the world strictly through their web browser. And an increasing number of those websites don't work in Firefox. Uh, a specific company's online learning platform, for example, <laughs> doesn't work with the browser that they ship. No. Um, what is Red Hat planning to do to combat this browser monoculture? We're probably not going to do much. We actually don't really ship a desktop, so it's not surprising to me that uh, we have some conflicts there. I also saw in the news recently, if, if somebody can confirm this, that Google's planning on not sponsoring Mozilla anymore. Like they're going to be pulling their search engine out because of people are fearing it because of uh, court, the, lo the lawsuit. So it hasn't happened. Okay, I don't want to spread misinformation. I, I saw a headline. Um, but yeah, no, uh, we're not really in the browser business. We've got a browser. Um, we work with part, uh, one of the main reasons we have that is because we work with partners. These are OEMs and, and things to make sure that, uh, for example, if they have terms of service with their RAID controller or something, that that stuff loads. That's, that's the kind of thing that we're looking at. But I'm not aware of any uh, plans inside Red Hat to, uh, to fix the browser problem. So it may have to be up to somebody else. Um, my question is that I see that there is a lot of value in having AI. Uh, as you said, we can have the chat board for the meeting summary, uh, summary for uh, failures analysis, log analysis. I also see that AI is the big thing right now. Uh, but I think we also need to strike a balance, not following each and everything. So what is the strategy, uh, not even Fedora, but at Red Hat also, that we are not following and get, getting into each and everything in AI space. So what is our main strategy there? And if you can talk a little bit more about the project Mullet, uh, that will be very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Um, the, the best way to not get into everything possible in, in AI is to not be able to afford it. And uh, I, think that's, uh, I think that's a pinnacle of where Red Hat is right now. We can't possibly be competing with the, uh, the open AIs of the world. Uh, not directly anyway, but uh, we've, t we've picked some targeted things. I think the biggest stuff for us you're going to see is around OpenShift AI. If you haven't taken a look at that, take a look. And then all the announcements we made at Summit this year are really where we're focusing our efforts. That's on RHEL AI, that's in Struct Lab, Granite Models, uh, things like that. Uh, we've got five minutes. Uh, Project Mullet is just an internal code name I've had uh, to try to get us to uh, uh, take the uh, PyTorch and related technology seriously. I think that's a, I think that that is probably a best bet technology right now. And even if we're wrong, we can change it later. We were wrong with Zen, switch it to KVM. Like these are things that we can do. But uh, for me, for my money, I think PyTorch and that ecosystem is where we're going to best succeed. Hey, Mike. Hey. Uh, out of all the sessions you have uh, seen at Flock, uh, which one really surprised you and most uh, make you more, uh, uh, made you more excited about? Which session surprised me? Hmm. I don't think any of them really surprised me. I was surprised that uh, Apple had a whole hour. <laughs> Where, where's Troy? I, it's fine. I was fine with it. It could, it could have been 30 minutes, but that was all right. Otherwise, uh, <laughs> otherwise I, I thought that was fine. I thought more people should have gone to the uh, Fedora server SIG. Uh, I mean, I went to that one. I had, that was s only slightly attended. I expected more interest at that one, but otherwise, there you go. So uh, business models in general has kind of been something that's been interesting to me, like kind of going back to the, the earlier question. Uh, why do you think Red Hat's business model is so hard to replicate? And what did, would you suggest for people interested in building like sustainable and scalable ventures uh, with kind of a similar upstream first policy to, to what Red Hat's doing, and does that change for whether you're selling to a business versus consumers? Yeah, I actually, uh, in a lot of ways, I don't know why Red Hat was so successful. I'm, sh I, I am sure it wasn't intentionally. Um, well, that's a chance. You know, just being honest. Um, I think, but I do think there are lessons that everybody can learn from Red Hat. First is never mix project and product. 
Um, I think having Fedora as a separate project from RHEL, the product, when you start mixing names, it becomes a problem. Ansible did that, it becomes a problem. Um, people get confused about the differences between them. That caused quite a bit of strife with us recently last year. Um, I think a lot of people were surprised to find that Red Hat no longer endorses rebuilds, for example. Um, that was something that was useful. We, we found for a while we went and sponsored the CentOS Linux community. And uh, over time, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it became a tomato and a fruit salad. You know, it's a, they, you know, there's a saying that says knowledge is knowing that uh, tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. And I think uh, CentOS Linux and the rebuilds have become uh, a tomato and a fruit salad to me. Uh, but for the for the, uh, I, but I also think that there have been plenty of companies that have successfully replicated what what uh, Red Hat does. Maybe not to that extent. Um, Rancher was acquired by you know we've got uh, when you take a group of people like this that have expert level knowledge of. Uh, uh, Linux internals, building operating systems, things like that. Um, they should be going out and pushing the industry further, inventing new things and contributing to our ecosystem. Uh, Susie bought Rancher for something like $600 million. Um, CoreOS was purchased by Red Hat for $250 million. Um, you know, I would, I would say that these were successful companies that did what they did. And had they, you know, they, they've been acquired, and they've grown far beyond that now. Had they not been acquired, I'm sure they also would have grown far beyond that. So I, I don't think that there's a specific magic out there to doing open source. And I do disagree with uh, some of the pundits and influencers that, A, have claimed Red Hat is closed source. I don't think so. Uh, or B, have claimed that uh, open core is really the right way to go. I think that Red Hat's proven that a fully open source model works great and, uh, and is, is, is one that uh, benefits the whole industry. So. We've seen what AI is doing. You've talked about that a few times. There are some other more um, emerging technologies that aren't necessarily getting the, the attention for that AI is. I'm curious if you have opinions on things like Wasm and what Red Hat's position might be for those spaces. Is there a different emerging area that is interesting to you beyond AI? I think uh, beyond AI, the big one for me is, uh, I'll go quickly, Ify. Um uh, so, uh, uh, secure compute, trusted computing um, in, in cloud spaces. That's one that I'm actually surprised has not taken off more than it already has. Um, I feel like we've been working on these technologies for a, almost, what is it, five years now in some of these. And uh, they have not gripped in ways that I had thought they would grip, especially in the government and elsewhere. So that, that's one that I'm looking out for. It's, it's, right, it's right adjacent to secure supply chain. People need it. People know they need it. But for some reason, it's not quite gotten that critical mass yet. So there you go. We're out of time, everyone. Thank you very thank you. much, Mike. Thank you to everyone for your questions. And folks, just a quick heads up for the evening plan. So from here, you can go directly to the Strong Museum of Play, which is a short walk distance away. Uh, or if you'd like to take some time to refresh, be there by 6.30. We'll have dinner. We have a open arcade hall at the Strong. It's the history. It's a national museum for the history and art of play. So we're going to have a great time tonight. Uh, you can go there directly right now. We've got folks who are already over there, but we'll start having everything, dinner and everything by 6.30, followed by the conference group photo. You can wear your conference shirt if you aren't already, but otherwise.